Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Well, look who's here, Julia. You picked the wrong target this time. Did you really think that it would be easy to mess with me? Well, no, Ariel said, kissing her stepdaughter on the forehead and closing the coffin lid. It sounds like a story from a series of creepy childhood jokes, doesn't it? But no. In reality, the story was just as eerie, but far from being a joke, and the girl lying in the coffin, Julia, wasn't playing along. She understood everything. This story began long before that dreadful stepmother's kiss. Julia lived with her dad, the only one, dear and very beloved. The only one because Julia had no mother. Not for a long time, so long that Julia couldn't remember. She had almost no memories of her, just occasional fragments of some recollections. Yes, since she lived in the age of digital technology, Julia had photos of her mom and numerous videos she shot with her father when she was little. But she didn't like looking at those photos and videos. It's like watching the same movie over and over again. Memories would be there, but they wouldn't be her memories. They would be memories of watching the film. That's how it was for Julia. She had almost no personal memories of her mother. She was three years old when her mother passed away. Julia was with her grandmother in the village. She only learned later, as an adult, that she went to visit her grandmother after her mom died. Her father didn't want the child to see all of it, the funeral, the coffin, and the wreaths. Perhaps, if Julia had attended the funeral, she would have preserved a clearer memory of her mother. And why do so many adults think they need to shield children from death? It's a part of life that will touch everyone. When Julia's dad brought her back from her grandmother's, everything was already behind them. There was no one at home, only her mom's portrait hanging on the wall with a black stripe in the corner. Where's mom? The little Julia asked, rightfully missing her. Mommy is in heaven, her dad said. Why? Did she leave us? The girl asked. No, she's just better off watching us from there. This way, she can always keep an eye on us, her father explained. But obviously, such explanations were enough for a three-year-old girl. Julia didn't ask more about what happened or why her mother died. Her father had explained everything. Only later, as a teenager, Julia somehow asked that question. She already understood that her mom wasn't in heaven but simply dead. She asked her dad how it could have happened. She was ill, her father replied briefly. Apparently, that was enough for the teenager. Overall, Julia lived well with her father. She had nannies, governesses, and tutors. Her grandmother lived in the village, and the girl grew up as a happy child. Her father tried several times to find a romantic partner, but for some reason, he never introduced any of them to his daughter. He just hesitated. Could any woman become a good mother for Julia? Olivio preferred to keep his women at a distance from his family and his daughter. One could say the storm hit when Julia turned 18. Her father fell in love. Julia, I need to talk to you, he said one evening. I'm all ears, the daughter replied, putting aside the phone she was engrossed in. You're already an adult and about to go to university. You might meet someone and get married. You're young and beautiful, and I really want you to have a fulfilling personal life, Olivio began, choosing his words carefully. Dad, what do you mean? I don't understand. Stop beating around the bush. Just say it, his daughter said. I'm getting at the fact that you'll leave home, and I'll be left alone, her father said. I'm not planning to leave. What are you talking about, Dad? What did you come up with? Julia asked cautiously. I mean, you'll grow up, and sooner or later, you'll want to live on your own. What am I supposed to do? Stay alone in this huge house? Olivio was getting frustrated, not with his daughter, but with himself, for not being able to say his problem out loud. Just say what you mean, you're scaring me, Dad, Julia said, concerned. Well, I want to get married, Olivio blurted out, blushing like a boy. Oh my God, and I thought, go ahead and get married, what does it have to do with me? Julia said, 
I'd like you to meet her, Olivio said. Oh, is that it? Julia smiled. So, you have a candidate? Well, sort of. We've been seeing each other for two years now, Olivio said, still blushing. Why have I found out about this now? Julia jokingly asked. I didn't want to hurt you, and the memory of your mom, Olivio began to explain in a somewhat awkward manner. Dad, what are you talking about? What memory? Fifteen years has passed since mom's death. I don't even remember what she looked like. Do you think I'm foolish and don't understand that you're entitled to have a woman in your life? You said it right, I'm an adult, but I didn't grow up yesterday. I've been an adult for a long time. If you had introduced her sooner, we would all have been happy for two years already, Julia said. What's her name? Who's? Olivio seemed a bit flustered. Come on, Dad, stop being shy. Her. What's her name? Who are you planning to marry? Julia laughed. Her? Ariel, Olivio answered. Ariel? Juliet asked again. Good Lord, couldn't you find a girl with a simpler name? Ariel. Well, I knew it, the father said, feeling hurt. Why have you done that? Oh, I was just kidding. Goodness, Ariel is her name. That's okay, Dad. When are you going to introduce us? Julia laughed. Whenever you want, Olivia replied. And when do you want to? Julia retorted. They decided to have a sort of meet and greet on the upcoming weekend. Overall, Julia liked Ariel, but she chose not to say anything to her father. After all, he was the grown-up, and he knew better. Besides, he was the one who would be living with her. Yet, Julia felt that Ariel was somehow not up to his level. You know, it was like putting a Versace shoe next to a felt boot. Not just placing them side by side, but wearing them both and going out into the world. They looked together like two socks from different pairs, with Ariel being the felt boot. She seemed a bit simple, rough, and somewhat unkempt. Julia couldn't stand women who dyed their hair, and this one clearly had grown out roots, which looked indecent. If she decided to change her hair color, she could do it regularly so that no one noticed. Well, these are just prejudices, Julia thought. If dad likes her, then why not? I certainly won't be the one choosing. Since then, Ariel has become a frequent guest in the house and often stayed overnight. Julia didn't mind. She was even happy for her father. When are you leaving your father's house? Ariel asked once when they were alone with Julia. Never, Julia said. And hypothetically, even if I go to college, and I will, of course, I'll still live at home. I have no intention of living in dorms. I see, Ariel pursed her lips. Everyone else does, and you're the princess, right? I don't understand, Julia became wary. Oh, don't pay attention. I have these jokes. I know it's black humor, but I can't seem to get rid of this bad habit. There was no one to teach me. I grew up in an orphanage, Ariel explained. It's okay, I understand. I grew up without a mother, too. Although I can't say I missed her much, I hardly remember her at all. I had more than enough nannies, grandma, and dad to fill her absence, Julia replied. They didn't talk much about leaving or studying after that, but Julia couldn't figure out why Ariel asked that question. Was she really the third wheel in such a huge two-story house with eight bedrooms, not counting the hall and the living room, plus a dining room? The house was so enormous that Juliet and her father could live without seeing each other for weeks, especially when her father had some projects and she had exams. They woke up and went to bed at different times. He would come home when she was already asleep. It was rare, but it happened. And then suddenly, this strange woman asked some questions for no apparent reason and then tried to turn everything into a joke. The special day arrived, and Julia's father married Ariel. Julia was burning with shame in front of her acquaintances at this wedding. It was the richest, most extravagant, and tasteless wedding on earth. Ariel embodied all her dreams, most likely taken from the dumb TV series she constantly watched in Olivio's absence. 
Her veil was the size of a house, and she was dressed in a cloud-like dress in which she looked like a squashed marshmallow. But Dad was happy, and Julia kept silent, only catching the mockeries of her father's acquaintances. But what could she do? After the wedding, she began transforming the house according to her taste. The walls in the living room turned pink, which Ariel, for some reason, called peach. Even if they were genuinely peach-colored, it wouldn't have improved the situation. Dad, our house is turning into Barbie's house, Julia said. Stop it, please. Oh, don't be upset, she likes it. I thought all girls loved pink, Olivio said. Not all. I don't. The love for pink is a sign of weak intellect. And it's not even pink, Dad, it's magenta. Julia exclaimed. So what? Let it be. We'll repaint it later in a different color, Olivio said. Later? When? When will I start throwing myself against these purple and magenta walls? Julia got irritated. I think you're jealous, Olivio said. No way, Julia retorted. You've become very irritable, her father replied. No wonder, Julia said, spreading her hands. I think I'm becoming a bit pink and dumb myself. Everyone soon forgot about the incident. Olivio, apparently, didn't say anything to Ariel. She continued to smile sweetly at Julia at the table, and Julia smiled back. Almost six months passed. It seemed like the atmosphere at home had improved. And then Ariel announced that the family would soon have an addition. Olivio was overjoyed like a child, and Julia. Well, she was happy, too, she was just a bit bewildered. The age difference between her and the new sibling would be 19 years. Oh God. Wherever she went with the baby, everyone would mistake her for the child's mother. But on the other hand, who should have cared anyway? They could think of what they wanted. Shortly after the happy news, Olivio had to leave. Come with me, he asked Ariel. Julia accidentally overheard their conversation. But I'm pregnant, Ariel said. So what? When else will we get a chance to travel abroad together, especially to such an exotic country? Olivio insisted. That's exactly what I mean, it's exotic. What if I get sick there? What about the child? What if we lose the baby? Ariel said. She's reasoning wisely, Julia thought, and she didn't bother listening further. Her father left, and literally the next day, Julia caught Ariel with a lover right in their bedroom. She had invited him directly into their bedroom. She assumed that Julia wouldn't have the courage to come to them, or perhaps, due to the scarcity of her mind, she assumed Julia simply wouldn't hear. Maybe she wouldn't have heard anything if someone had laughed a little quieter. At first, Julia didn't understand what was happening. She went to the kitchen at night to get some water to drink. If it weren't for thirst, she might not have heard anything. Everything was God's will and the will of chance. Julia heard Ariel laughing loudly at two in the morning. She's probably watching some movie, Julia thought. Then she heard male laughter. By the voice, it wasn't her father's, and it couldn't be him, he was away. Maybe it was the television? But no, the voice was real and authentic. Then Ariel said something, and after that, she squealed like a piglet. Julia couldn't take it anymore. After all, isn't she the mistress of the house? She opened the door to the bedroom. Oh, Ignacio, stop, you're tickling me. Ariel squealed, lying on her back, and Ignacio grumbled like a bear, climbing on top of his stepmother. What's going on here? Julia asked. The lovers suddenly froze in place and listened. I think someone's here, Ignacio said. Ariel pushed him away. He rolled onto his back, and both of them stared at Julia, standing in the doorway. Two glasses and an empty bottle were on the table near the bed. So, you can't go with Dad because of your pregnancy, but you can drink with a lover? Julia asked calmly. She was surprised by her own composure. For some reason, she was sure that this marriage would end up like this. Well, they were different people after all. Girl, what do you understand about life? 
Ariel said mockingly. What did you see? Nothing. And I'm not in a monastery. No one prohibited me from meeting friends. Your friends even come to you and stay overnight. My friends come to me, not lovers, Julia said. Who's the lover here? Where's the lover? Ignacio, do you see a lover here? Ariel deliberately pretended to look for someone, peering under the pillow and under the bed. I saw what you two were doing here, Julia said. And what were we doing? We're just fooling around like kids, having fun. It's fun for us. Right, Ignacio? Ignacio is my buddy. No one said that friends could only be girls. If boys don't come to you, it's not my problem, it's yours, the stepmother said. Ariel knew well that the best defense was a good offense. And this? What will you say to this? Julia pointed to the glasses. You're pregnant, aren't you? Who? Me? No, I'm not pregnant anymore and never was. Just for you to know, Ariel raised her voice and started moving towards Julia like a mountain. There was no child, and there couldn't be one. I won't ever give birth to a child. Ariel exclaimed. Then why did you lie to us about the child? Juliet asked, stepping back. For the same reason, I needed to do it. You don't need to know, Ariel replied. I'm calling Dad right away. Julia yelled and turned to climb the stairs to her room. Ignacio, catch her, Ariel commanded. Julia ran down the stairs, but her legs inexplicably became weak. She felt a blow to the back of her head. Everything darkened, and she lost consciousness. And now what? A confused Ignacio asked, placing on the nightstand a hefty crystal ashtray with which he had hit Julia. Just don't panic. I'll call my brother. He'll sort everything out, Ariel said. Brother? You're an orphan, Ignacio said. So what? Salvador is an orphan too. You know, it happens. If parents are deprived of parental rights, all the children are taken away. Don't bother me, I'm trying to think, Ariel said. Who is Salvador, God Almighty, or maybe a deputy? What will we tell her father? Ignacio nervously asked. He seemed to regret forty times over already that he had listened to Ariel and grabbed that ashtray. He shouldn't have done anything. What was it to him? He would have gone home and let Ariel deal with her husband herself. This woman knew how to manipulate people on the fly. Hello, Salvador, darling, come over, I need your help. Ariel was trying to speak with the sweetest voice possible, almost sugary. What do you mean again? No, I don't understand. Who protected you from the drunken dad with an axe in childhood? No, I won't reproach you, I'm just reminding. Come here, I said. Waiting. And don't you grumble at me. You're my brother, after all, Ariel grumbled. So who is Salvador? Ignacio repeated the question. Salvador is the director of the crematorium, Ariel said proudly. Oh, if you only knew how many problems he solved over the years. Whoosh, one press of a button, and no problem. We'll just burn her to hell. What will you tell the father? Ignacio asked. I'll say she ran away from home. God, she's 18. If I were the same age, I would run away from home every week. I'll say she found a guy, fell in love, and ran away. He'll search, of course, and find nothing. He'll wither away from grief. If I pour him Nora's tincture, he'll die, and this house will be ours, Ariel laughed joyfully. And what will you tell him about the child? You're not pregnant, are you? Ignacio puzzled. I'll say that after Julia ran away without saying goodbye, I was so worried and anxious for her that I had a miscarriage. It's simple. This scheme has been working for thousands of years, Ariel continued to laugh. Julia groaned and began to climb the stairs. You're resilient, damn it, Ariel said, taking a small dark glass bottle from the nightstand with some liquid. She dropped some into a glass, added water, and brought it to Julia's mouth. Drink, sweetheart, 
Drink. That's it. Good. Julia took a sip and passed out again. Is this the same tincture? Ignacio asked. Yeah, the same one, Ariel said, putting the bottle back on the nightstand. Soon, the brother arrived. Julia came to her senses again, not understanding what was happening or where she was. She was in a box. Ariel was standing over her, looking at her with a devilish grin. She again brought the glass to Julia's lips. Julia was terribly thirsty. She had never experienced such thirst in her life, not even when she and her dad were on a hike and drowned the backpack with supplies and a water bottle. They spent two days afterward navigating through the forest to the road, really wanting a drink. Julia tried to drink from the river or ditch several times, but her father didn't allow it. You'll catch cholera or Escherichia coli. I won't carry you to the hospital. Endure it. A person can live without water for three days or even more. We'll reach people's settlements soon. Eat berries, they are watery enough, her father used to say. Julia understood that her stepmother was giving her something wrong and tried to turn away, but she had no strength to resist. She could hardly even turn her head. Ariel grabbed her by the chin, poured the liquid into her mouth, and said, There you go, Julia. You finally pushed it too far. You thought you were dealing with a simpleton, but no. Then she kissed Julia on the forehead and closed the coffin lid. Now she won't wake up, for sure. I gave her a huge dose. Everything swirled before Julia's eyes, and she fell unconscious again. She no longer thought about where she was, where she ended up, or what happened to her. For some reason, she thought about her mom, although she hadn't remembered her for almost her entire life. Mom, mommy, she was trying to whisper in the darkness, but her lips didn't obey. Ariel, when will this stop? Salvador asked. Salvador, do you want to live in a big, beautiful house and want nothing? Do you? Then shut up and do as I say. Okay, dear. Ariel played with her brother's cheeks as if he were her little puppy. She left and went home with Ignacio. Salvador simply couldn't stay at work. It would raise suspicion. Pancho, take a break tonight, and tomorrow morning, along with the first deceased, you'll take care of this coffin, understood? Salvador told the attendant. And the documents? Pancho asked. That's my responsibility. Relatives are deeply in mourning. I'll handle everything tomorrow, and you'll get a bonus. You want a bonus, right? Good. Just shut up and do as you're told. And get your dog out of here, Salvador said. Where should I take him, Salvador? Pancho objected. Anywhere you want. Take him home. Why do I need a dog here? There are traces all over the building. Do you play hide-and-seek with it around the office? The cleaning ladies complained that we have werewolves wandering here, said Salvador. I can't take him home. I have nowhere to go. My mom and I share a room, Pancho replied. Then send him to the incinerator. At least he won't suffer, Salvador said and left. That's it, buddy. They said you're going to the incinerator. Pancho scratched behind the ear of the old dog with intelligent eyes. Just a couple of weeks ago, he had taken in and fed this dog, and someone had already complained. What traces could there be all over the building? Pancho let the dog into the corridor to play a little. The dog had been sitting under the stairs all day, even for more than one day, waiting for Pancho's shift. He knew that in his absence, it had to behave quietly. Where should I take you tomorrow when the shift is over? Pancho asked the dog again. The dog approached the coffin that Salvador had just brought and nudged it with his nose. What? Do you want me to hide you in the coffin? Pancho asked. No, Salvador will personally send you to the incinerator. And it's dark and stuffy there. It's better under the stairs. Or do you want me to take you to a shelter? It's warm there, and they say they feed you. Not like me, of course, but constantly. 
The dog shook his head from side to side, as if showing his disagreement, as if he really understood what the guy was saying, and again nudged his nose into the same coffin. That's how the dog spent almost all morning, constantly poking his nose into the coffin. What's wrong with this coffin? What's inside, or who? Pancho had long suspected the director of foul play, but opening it in the middle of the night was really scary. Pancho wasn't alone here. He wasn't superstitious and wasn't afraid of werewolves or vampires. But what if there was a healthy guy with an axe in the coffin? Who knew? Max didn't let him even doze off a bit, not to mention sleep. He constantly approached the cot where Pancho had settled, breathing on his face, and then called somewhere. Usually, the night shift attendants dozed off on this cot. What else to do? What, if the deceased ran away? Maybe the dog needs to go outside? Pancho thought. But Max didn't lead him to the door, but again to the same coffin. The pre-dawn light seeped through the window. It was already very early in the morning. Pancho decided to take action, took a crowbar, a small one, like a sledgehammer, and opened the lid. At the sight of what he saw, he collapsed onto the stool. There was not a guy with an axe in the coffin, but a girl. A beautiful one. She was lying on her side, hands and legs tied. Her eyelashes fluttered a bit, and she was breathing, weakly, but still, she was alive. Gosh. So that's what they're doing here. And what am I supposed to do with all this now? Disobeying Salvador meant, sooner or later, that she would end up in the same coffin as this girl. But there was no way to carry out the order either. How could one incinerate a living person? It's not the Gestapo or Auschwitz, for heaven's sake. Pancho tried to revive the girl, but she didn't react to anything. Most likely, she was drugged with something, Pancho thought. I have to save her somehow. He couldn't come up with anything better than to carry the girl down the stairs, where Max always hid, and hide her among unnecessary boxes. In the morning, as Salvador had asked, Pancho burned the coffin in the incinerator along with the first deceased. Actually, nobody mentioned anything about the contents. There was only one problem, now Max had nowhere to hide, and precisely at two in the afternoon, Pancho's shift ended. However, right now, he wasn't thinking about the dog. He was more concerned about the situation with the girl. How could he get her off the crematorium premises without anyone noticing? Never mind anyone, the main thing was that Salvador wouldn't notice. Leaving the girl under the stairs until dark wasn't an option. What if she regained consciousness? Pancho was already taking risks. He didn't know the cause of her unconsciousness, so she could come to her senses at any moment. So, how did everything go? Salvador asked Pancho when they were alone in the office. As usual, Pancho replied. What do you mean, as usual? You talk as if I ask you for a favor every day. Salvador got angry. Not in that sense, Pancho began to justify himself, internally scolding himself for loose lips. I mean that no one noticed anything. And no one was supposed to notice anything. Our schedule is planned two weeks ahead, and these people simply couldn't wait that long. So, we had to help good people, Salvador said. Yes, I completely agree with you, Pancho replied. He practically prayed for Salvador to go somewhere, and miraculously, Salvador left at 12, two hours before the end of Pancho's shift. It would be suspicious if he stayed after work, he had never done that before. Pancho called a taxi, carefully moved the girl from under the stairs to the back seat, and took her home. They lived on the outskirts in old barracks left over from the war. Everything was made of wood there, the floor, the ceiling, and the walls. The toilet was outside, and the water was from a column, also outside. In essence, the house was a large shed divided into several small rooms and, in the middle, a large and long corridor for the entire barracks, cluttered with all sorts of junk that residents couldn't fit into their rooms. That's how Pancho and his mom lived. They cooked in the shared kitchen, but if there wasn't enough space and time, they reheated food on an electric stove right in their room, even though it was strictly forbidden. Mom, we have a guest, Pancho said, carrying the unconscious girl in his arms. 
Oh, Lord, Pancho, where did you get her? What happened to her? Who did this to her? His mom asked, bustling around, removing the blanket from the bed. Later, Mom, I'll explain everything later. She needs help, can't you see? She's drugged with something. It's been almost a day, and she can't come to her senses, Pancho said, laying the girl down. So, she needs an four, his mom said. I'll buy everything, just write it down. You're the doctor, I'm still learning, Pancho said. What am I, a doctor? I never got my diploma, I left during the fifth year before the exams, his mom said. I still don't understand you. How is that even possible? Pancho even widened his eyes for added emphasis. Well, I sometimes don't understand myself. But it's already done. The breathing seems steady, there is no wheezing, and the heartbeat is good. Let her rest, and you go to the pharmacy, his mom said. She quickly scribbled a list on a piece of paper and escorted Pancho out the door. He stepped outside the gate. There was a wooden fence with gates around their barracks, as if it was a separate territory for outcasts, like another planet or another country. Pancho went out and literally bumped into Max. The dog was dirty and limping on his right paw. How did you get here? Pancho wondered. Sorry for leaving you, but I had to save the girl. How did you find me? How did you know where I live? The dog couldn't answer him in words, but as a response, it extended its paw. Pancho looked and saw that there were calluses on its pads. It seemed that the unfortunate dog had run all the way behind the taxi they were in. Mom, just don't scold me, Pancho said from the doorway. What, is there another girl? His mom joked. No. Seems like a guy, Pancho said, opening the front door. Pancho, have you gone mad? The neighbors will kick us out. They have to put up with us after your father's death. He was the warden here, and they gave him a room. They could kick us out. What do we do with him? His mother lamented. The dog obediently sat on the threshold and looked at the woman with big, intelligent eyes. He didn't rush into the room, but quietly peered, sniffing with his big, leathery nose. Mom, Salvador promised to put him in the oven in the crematorium, Pancho said. And you wanted a dog yourself. I wanted a small dog, and look at this one, he's like half a room, his mother said fearfully. Please, just for one night, and then I'll figure something out. And, by the way, he found her in a coffin, Pancho said. Where? Did I get it right? In a coffin? Oh, Lord. What is happening there if they bury girls alive? His mother said. Well, let him in now before anyone sees. And only after these words did the dog quietly enter the room and immediately curl up in a ball on the rug where they put their shoes. He didn't even sniff the room or approach the landlady. Amazing, his mom said. Agree, Pancho confirmed. At night, after two drips and an injection, Julia stirred and groaned. She opened her eyes and saw a woman next to her. She was sitting on the bed, holding her hand and smiling a little. She looked exactly like the woman in the portraits in her father's room with a black ribbon in the corner. Mom? Julia whispered. Hush, the woman whispered, covering her with a blanket. I'm your mom, right? No, seriously. Mom, it's me. I'm Julia. Don't you recognize me? I'm your daughter. Did I die or something? Where am I? Panicking, Julia jumped up and sat on the bed. The woman, resembling the portrait but with a few strands of gray hair, looked at her literally bewildered. Are you Julia? Julia Castro? The woman asked in bewilderment. Yes, I'm Julia Castro. Where am I? Julia yelled. Calm down, you're not dead. We saved you. Just calm down, you'll remember everything later and tell us. You're safe. Right? Mom? She's a bit delirious. You reminded her of her mother, it seems, Pancho intervened. 
He turned around and looked at his mom, who was sitting as if paralyzed, covering her mouth with her hands, unable to utter a word. Mom, why are you silent? What's going on here? Do you know her? Pancho asked. She. She's my daughter, the woman said, unable to contain her emotions, and started hugging Julia. But you died. You died when I was three, Julia said. Did your father tell you that? The woman asked. He did, Julia replied bewilderedly. Were you at my funeral? Mom asked. No, I was little. They sent me to my grandmother's, and then Dad said. So that's how he concocted everything, the woman said, walking to the window. She stared into the distance for a long time, probably trying to hide her tears. For some time, everyone was sitting in silence, only the dog was snoozing on the rug. He just kicked me out of the house like a dog, without money, without my belongings, without documents, the woman began to speak without turning away from the window. He decided that I had cheated on him, but they just lied to him. He didn't let me say a word in my defense, although I had nothing to justify, I was not guilty of anything. People envied us and lied to him, but he believed them. I was trying to fight for you. I came to the gate of our, or rather, his, house, but he called the police every time. He had a lot of money, and money solves everything. In the end, I gave up, and then I met Pancho's father. He was a good man, a very good man. He helped me and saved me. Yes, I gave up, but I didn't reconcile. Julia, my baby. The woman rushed to her daughter and began to kiss her hands. Not a day passed without me thinking about you, and now the Lord has brought you to me. But how? Julia, what happened to you? Is it him again? Julia shook her head and told her about Ariel. Actually, he's a good guy. He loves me and knows nothing about what happened. It's even hard for me to imagine what she'll tell him about my disappearance, Julia said. All him. Do you remember the number? Pancho, you have a phone, right? Give it to her, Mom asked. Pancho handed the phone to Julia. Their hands touched slightly, and for some reason, Julia blushed. She had already noticed how handsome one of her rescuers was. He was handsome, and it seemed he was her brother. So, is Pancho my younger brother? Julia asked. If he's a brother, then the older one, her mom corrected. How's that? I don't understand. Julia was surprised. He's my adopted son. When I met his father, Pancho was six. He's three years older than you. His real mom did pass away, the mother replied. I got it, Julia smiled and, for some reason, felt like an idiot. In such a complicated situation, she was smiling. Julia dialed the number. Hello. Who's this? Her father shouted. Dad, it's me, Julia, the girl answered excitedly. Julia? What's wrong with you? Who are you with? Who did you run away with? Her father shouted. Because of you, Ariel had a miscarriage, and she's in the hospital. I can't fly back so quickly, there are no tickets. Come back home quickly, and don't go anywhere until I return. I didn't run away, Dad. Your Ariel poisoned me and wanted to cremate me. And she wasn't pregnant. I caught her with a lover. She only needs your money, Julia said. So where are you? I don't understand, her father asked. I'm at mom's, Julia said. They fell silent, and she could only hear the father's heavy breathing. Wait for me there, I'll come, he finally said. Do you know where it is? Julia asked. I do, Olivia replied shortly and hung up. So, he didn't even deny anything. All these years, he kept me in the dark, but he knew where you were, Julia said after a long silence. Two days later, there was a knock on the door of the barracks room. The dog raised its head and growled softly. The dog didn't bark loudly and cheerfully, breaking the silence, but simply purred quietly, like a refrigerator starting after a shutdown. Max, calm down, Julia said. I think I know who's there. 
Olivio opened the door and entered. While surveying the room, he saw Julia. His eyes immediately softened, and he hugged his daughter. Let's go home, he said. Only with mom, Julia said. Otherwise, I won't go. It seems like you have things to talk about. What's there to talk about? Yes, I messed up, but I can't undo anything. When I realized I was wrong and had made the biggest mistake of my life, it was already too late. She was married, Olivio said. Bridges were burned. Forgive me if you can, Olivio said to his wife. I forgave you a long time ago, she said. And by the way, she's a widow now, Julia added. I didn't know that, my condolences, he said. I'm fine, the woman replied. Well, shall we go home? Julia rejoiced. But Ariel is there, Olivio said. Oh, can I take care of this lady? Julia said. Pancho, are you with me? After Ariel saw Julia at home, whose ashes were supposed to be scattered to the wind, she lost her mind. She was admitted to a mental institution. Ignacio was convicted of serious bodily harm and concealing a crime. Salvador also faced consequences. During the investigation, the Pialis uncovered several similar crimes, so he had to be glad that there was no moratorium on the death penalty in the country. After all the turmoil and officially getting divorced from Ariel, the family was finally reunited. Mom didn't rush to romanticize her relationship with Olivio, but she moved into the house to finally be closer to her daughter, with whom she had been separated for so many years, and to her son, who married Julia. Max was most pleased with their move to the house. It frolicked through the rooms and the spacious yard. For saving his daughter, it could lie wherever he wanted, even on the owner's bed. But the dog wasn't cheeky, it was smart and behaved decently. It liked running around, but it still loved to lie on the rug near the front door. In the spring, Max brought five puppies right there on the rug, quietly and peacefully at night. I was right when I told you it was another girl, Mom laughed. He's so furry, you can't tell. So I thought it was a boy, Pancho said. Oh, you all think that way. Will you also think our child is a boy? Julia asked. No, I won't think so. Now there's an ultrasound, it will tell us, Pancho replied. Wait a minute, are you trying to tell us that you're expecting a child? Mom asked Julia. Well, finally. At least someone got it. Yes, I'm pregnant, Julia said. Thank you for listening till the end. Don't forget to subscribe and give us a thumbs up. It really motivates us. All the best. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.